floor. You know? Yeah. That's where yeah, they got yeah. Bruce. And yo, it's crazy because he was living in one of the best buildings in the hood, you know? That's crazy. Like, you, no, none of the men lived there. Those are condos. Badge number 5371 of 32 Division. My partner here is... Constable Dying, uh, 100553 Division. Okay, sir, and your name is... Grace MacArthur. Today, I have another wild story from our beautiful city in Toronto where things can get ugly. Ugly is an understatement when it comes to the gruesome details of this sick mall Santa who loved the brown boys. Today on Real Toronto Serial Killers, we tell the twisted story of Bruce MacArthur. Hit the like, the share, and subscribe for more content like this. Now I was inspired to do this piece after doing the Roadrunner Thorncliffe Park interview where he pointed out the two twin buildings where Bruce lived in one of the apartments. And this is also where some of the victim's remains were found. In that building up that there? That brown building, get that building right there. Oh. Yeah, that's where Bruce MacArthur was on the 11th floor. You know? Yeah. That's where they yeah, got yeah. Bruce. And yo, it's crazy because he was living in one of the best buildings in the hood, you know? That's crazy. Like, you, no, none of them had him live yeah, there. Those are condos. Now from the piece, it was explained that Thorncliffe Park is an area with a high South Asian population with people from Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Sudan. And it was definitely visible when I was on my tour. Now, um, uh, Afghan. Pakistani, Indian, you know what I mean? We have mm -hmm. a lot of Sudanese people that moved in, you get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm, you get mm -hmm. them right there too, you know what I mean? Huh. When Runner pointed out the buildings, I had a moment of eureka when I realized something. Why would a white Anglo-Saxon serial killer make Thorncliffe Park his home? To understand how we got there, we have to go back. Bruce MacArthur, AKA Big Bruce, was born October 8th, 1951, and grew up in Lindsay, Ontario. His parents, Islay and Malcolm MacArthur, ran a foster center in their town. Kids would get sent to their foster home from Toronto, and the place never received complaints, giving the MacArthurs a good reputation in their small town. In school, Bruce was known as a teacher's pet and a class rat. Bruce's mother raised the foster children in addition to Bruce and his sister. And Bruce himself speculates that his father was tough on him and made him work harder than the others because he sensed that his son lacked masculinity. The family, based in rural Ontario, also got into a lot of faith-based arguments, especially because Bruce's father and mother were of different Christian denominations, Presbyterian and Catholic respectively. In high school, Bruce met his high school sweetheart Janice Campbell and eventually married her and moved to Oshawa, Ontario. The two gave birth to son and daughter Todd and Melanie. Bruce took up a job in Toronto as a traveling salesman. At first they had a normal marriage, but over time it was evident that Bruce wasn't into his wife. He came out the closet as gay in the early 90s and the couple decided that they should have an open marriage. Things went a little left at one point when the couple's son got into a little bit of legal trouble. The MacArthur's son, Todd, was known for doing indecent things to phone operators that I won't mention on this video right here. Eventually, Bruce and Janet got divorced and Bruce moved to Toronto to the Church and Wellesley area, aka the Gay Village. Bruce got into it deep, pause, and had his first relationship. He was way more serious than his new boyfriend, and after the breakup, he started taking antidepressants. At the time, he also started a landscaping company called Artistic Design. It seemed that Bruce liked things rough sometimes, a little bit too rough, and in September 2010, he took his rough sexual activities to his first murder. Shout out to our sponsors, Astro Pink, always coming with that loud, loud. Check them out on their website, myastropink.com, or you can hit them up on Instagram, at astro underscore pink. If you know, you know. Skandaraj Navaratman, Skandaraj or Skanda as he was known to his friends, is remembered as a charming, kind and charismatic man who came to Canada as a gay immigrant from Sri Lanka. Skanda went missing over Labor Day weekend in 2010. He was last seen leaving the Zipper nightclub near Church and Carlton Street with an unknown man. Abdul Basir Fazi, 44. Abdul Basir was funny, smart, and loved his kids according to a longtime friend. He was also living a double life as a gay man when he went missing in 2010. Fazi's wife, two daughters, and longtime friend had no idea he frequented Toronto's gay village neighborhood until after he disappeared on December 29, 2010. Fazi called his wife to tell her he was at work with a colleague and would be home later that night. That was the last time she spoke to him. When Fazi never returned home, his cousin reported him missing to Peel Regional Police the next day. A week later, police discovered Fazi's abandoned car a short drive away from Mallory Crescent, where the remains of MacArthur's other victims would be discovered in the future. Majid Kahan, 58. Majid lived on Church Street and frequented the bars in the area. Majid also knew MacArthur before he went missing. 
Jalil Kahan, Majid's brother, said in a victim impact statement that Jaheed was the youngest of the siblings. He leaves behind niece, nephew, two children, and three grandchildren. Sarush Mahmoudi, 50. Sarush was an easygoing jokester who liked to go camping and play soccer. That's how his friend Brett Morrison remembers him. The two were friends for about a decade while they worked at an automotive factory in Barrie, Ontario. Mahmoudi was last seen alive August 15, 2015, near his apartment building on Markham Road in Scarborough. It was said that he was killed around that same day by Bruce MacArthur. Mahmoudi's son-in-law reported him missing. In 2015, the police started actually doing their job after multiple reports of missing persons. Swiss police gave tips to an alleged cannibal ring that prompted an investigation into missing people. The name James Alex Brunson came up in Project Houston. There was also an assault warrant issued for MacArthur's arrest. He did not request a lawyer when he turned himself in for assault when he was being interrogated in 2015. In the interrogation, he was questioned about an assault where he choked a man. In the interrogation, he described a lot of sexual activity and said that things got rough and the man asked to be choked and choked him back and then got out of the vehicle. In the interrogation, he managed to flip the story and walk away from the 32 division back to his killing spree. Um, reason for bringing your hands up to his neck. What was your understanding? I just think I thought he liked it rough. Okay. Next on the list of victims was Karusha Kamar Kanagaraknan. Karushna came to Canada in hopes of a bright future in the new country that can help him provide for his family in Sri Lanka. In 2013, Karushna told a friend that he met on the MV Sunsea that both his application for refugee status and his subsequent appeal had been rejected. In the next couple of years, he called his mother on the phone every day, but the call stopped coming in late August 2015. When she tried to call him, the phone wasn't working. His family was very worried, but never reported him missing because he thought he was in hiding, scared that Canadian authorities planned to send him back to Sri Lanka. MacArthur killed Kanagarathnan in January of 2016. Dean Losowick, one of the only white victims, was a young sex worker in the gay village. Losowick was also a regular inhabitant of the Toronto shelter system. He was last admitted to a shelter in April of 2016, the same month MacArthur killed him. Unlike most of Bruce's other victims, Losowick was never reported missing. Selim Asin, 44, born in Istanbul and grew up in Ankara, he worked to help support his family while earning a university degree. His older brother Omar Asin and Ferhat Senar said Isan was unhappy as a gay man living in Turkey and spent several years in Austria before moving to Canada in 2013 to marry his boyfriend. The relationship didn't last, but Isan stayed in Toronto. Over time, he went through his ups and downs, but he turned his life around and even started giving back to the community. Isan had been a client of the Toronto-based St. Stephen Community House, but he also completed a peer training program and was set to begin providing peer support, such as accompanying other medical appointments, running workshops and such. Isan went missing over Easter weekend of 2017. He was last seen alive near Bloor Street East and Ted Rogers Way. Andrew Kinsman, 49. A social justice warrior and accomplished chess player, Kinsman was popular in the gay village. One of Andrew's friends described him as one of the most predictable, responsible people in her life. Kinsman spent decades involved in the Toronto HIV slash AIDS network and had deep roots in the LGBT community. He also worked superintendent for his apartment building in Toronto's Cabbage Town neighborhood where he lived with his beloved cat. So when the aging feline was left alone a day after the city's annual pride parade on June 2017, his friends grew worried. Kinsman was last seen on June 26, 2017. Surveillance videos show him getting into MacArthur's van outside his apartment building that day. Police said the two men had been in a sexual relationship for some time. It was said that MacArthur killed Kinsman on or about the day he went missing. Now, what are the similarities that we see here? Most of these victims were South Asian immigrants with the exceptions of Andrew Kinsman and Dean Losowick. In the South Asian community, homosexuality is frowned upon and none of the victims' family are aware of the downward relationships that they were having. What's also disturbing about this case is the fact that they brought MacArthur in for questioning. One thing that maybe we haven't asked before we uh, conclude. I don't know, we have had, you know, numerous times and never had a problem. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, uh, time that I have is uh, 10.28. Complete the interview here. But they let him go, blaming the accusations on rough play. In October 2017, Bruce's unique special edition Burgundy Dodge Caravan was spotted by surveillance and linked to his name. Now, things started coming together when Toronto police received tips from Switzerland of all places. 
Now, there was an internal investigation linked to missing peoples from Toronto from a global organization called Cannibal leading back to Switzerland. Now, the case mentioned formerly mentioned other sicko, James Alex Brenton, an ex-hockey coach and pedo and convicted child lure that was accused of killing Skanderaj and chopping him up. Though he wasn't convicted for that, this sicko was convicted for a bunch of other disgusting shit that we won't talk about on this video. I am very sorry for what happened for my wife and family. The good thing from this tip from Swiss authorities, though wrong, it led to connections between Skanderaj and two other of MacArthur's victims. We also have to mention in 2017, MacArthur got his past criminal record suspended before moving to 95 Thorncliffe Park Drive. Let's talk about that. Like, Yo, that's where the highest... Bruce MacArthur. In that building up that there? That brown building. Get that building right there. Um... Yeah, that's where Bruce MacArthur was on the 11th floor. You know? Uh, that's where they yeah, got Bruce. Yeah. And you know, it's crazy because he was living in one of the best buildings in the hood, you know? That's crazy. Like, you, no, none of them had him live yeah, there. Those are condos. <laughs> Yo, none of them had him live there. I'll be real with you. We haven't even been inside that building. I'll be real with you. Like, and we, he's over there doing yeah, he crazy shit. Crazy sh yeah. The van that he drove around to meet his victim would be the same one that ended up getting him arrested. Surveillance from the home of the last victim, Andrew Kinsman, showed the Burgundy 2004 Special Edition Dodge Caravan that was linked to MacArthur's name. This launched Project Prism based on the missing persons in the gay village. This picked up where Project Houston left off three years ago before when Bruce MacArthur was first brought in for questioning. Bruce was put under heavy surveillance and police wanted to seize the Dodge Caravan, but he sold it. In August of 2017, investigators tracked down the sale of the caravan and searched it for evidence. Inside, they found the DNA of Bruce as well as three missing persons. From that, they issued a search warrant to 95 Thorncliffe Park Drive. The police received a warrant to search his apartment and found some sick shit while Bruce wasn't home. There was over a hundred pictures of Andrew Kinsman in his laptop, plus multiple pics of other men and pics taken in mad locations without people knowing. Even pics while he was doing his job as the mall Santa. God damn. Other pics showed victims Andrew Kinsman and Salima seen with ropes around their neck. The police had enough evidence to see that this was serial killer behavior and decided to take real action. January 18, 2018, MacArthur was raided while in the middle of a murder. He had a man with a plastic bag over his head and his A-Yo sticking out. MacArthur was arrested and charged with first degree murder. While in custody, the police went to his other home where we stored his landscaping equipment. In that home, police found five large pots in the garden where the cadaver dogs found the remains of seven more victims. The dogs also discovered multiple bones, including skulls on the location. Eight victims' body parts were found on the scene. On MacArthur's USB stick, there was eight folders with the victims' names that he knew with a ninth folder made up for the 2B victim. In January 2019, Bruce MacArthur was convicted for the murder of all eight victims with no eligibility for parole, keeping him locked up till he's 95 years old. So what have we learned here? Was this a case of sloppy police work? A lack of urgency based on race? Or was the fact that so many of the victims were on the down low made it harder to uncover this mystery? I'll let y'all decide in the comments. RIP to the victims and condolences to their family. Peace.